Wednesday. Uh, if we're in for another warm day outside, well, the temperature remains frigid in here, so I guess we're okay. Um, I always say when it gets this hot, we should be in school. Though I taught in schools before air conditioning. <laughs> yeah, Billy's gone. Her head. <laughs> it's your name. We remember those days. Um, so the first thing I want to do today, just for your consideration, we're going to, we, we um, wrote up new language on the professional dress. I'll leave that with you. I'll point out the things that we changed and we'll just move on. So I'll leave it with you for your consideration. Uh, if you have any questions, of course, at that point in time, we'll, we'll entertain those. Um, this is our 
response to the new language that you wrote yesterday, and um, uh, we welcome, of course, feedback from you guys. I will say this, though. Um, we actually had a little discussion this morning. We do appreciate the fact that you moved that one paragraph to the beginning about, you know, if you're a PE teacher or for some reason your job description. I think uh, uh, Ms. Cope pointed it out the other day that it was already there. I think having kind of it earlier in the, in the language is, 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 a, is a good change. Um, but I think, do we have copies, uh, Brenda? We do. All right. I'll let her pass those out. And then we'll cover that. <clears throat> and then I assume we will go into the monetary. Is that kind of what you're thinking this morning? Oh, okay. Okay, as a, per our discussion yesterday, um, the topic stays the same with the change that you made uh, moving the language from the end of the article to the beginning about um, dress being appropriate to the uh, task at hand. Um, clothing not appropriate for the classroom educational setting includes, but is not limited to the following. Uh, it's of course left the same. We left in toward or frayed jeans, but we crossed out faded uh, rubber flip-flops or similar type shoes. I feel was adequately explained by <coughs> Ms. Ramberg yesterday, so I think we're fine with that. Leggings or spandex pants, except if paired with a dress. We are not comfortable with appropriate length. Uh, we added or tunic style top. See-through tops, halters, midriffs, tops and half tops. I think we all agree should stay in there. Uh, we added non-school logo t-shirts or sweatshirts. We understand that that's a hard sell, but we want you to understand how important that is to us. Um, jogging or athletic wear, including sweatpants or yoga pants. Your language that you shared back with us just didn't have pants. So yoga pants is just the addition that we did there. And if uh, considering that we put non-school logo t-shirts in the bulleted list, we took it out of the certified staff, made professional staff, they wear jeans. Again, we took faded out of there. Uh, school logo t shirts or sweatshirts, we took out of there because we included it up above as non logo uh, shirts. So, uh, those are the changes that we made based on the discussion and our concerns yesterday. I realize that there will probably be more discussion about this uh, this morning, but uh, I wanted to share that with you that that's. In a draft three, I would say draft one, draft four. Draft one is the original language. Draft two, we handed to you. Draft three was your response, and then this is our response to um, to your language that you shared with us yesterday. So I'll pause for a moment in case there are any questions, concerns from the other side. Not that I have any questions, but. Uh, I just I want to point out something that should be obvious. Uh, in our counter proposal, we eliminated the tunic style top. Uh, I cannot see us uh, changing uh, our minds on that uh, as far as including that, uh, as far as. But that's how they're not appropriate. Well, no, that's not something that we're going to. Uh, you won't see that in any language that we can with. It just to let you know uh, on that. Uh, you already mentioned about the t-shirts and sweatshirts uh, being a hard sell, uh, and that is true. It would be a hard sell. Uh, faded, uh, we don't have a problem with, and we'll have some discussions, but I would doubt very seriously if we have a problem with you eliminating uh, of appropriate length when it comes to the dress. So that's 
that's the initial reaction uh, to the uh, proposal. Thank you for your comments uh, on uh, that. It's for you. It's for you. It's for you. Question? No. Nope. We're good. Okay. All right. Just checking. All right. So that's on the table. Um, I'm ready to move forward with monetary items. But before I do that, any. Um, Issues that are lingering still from yesterday on the behalf of your on behalf of your team um, before we move forward. did discuss, I, I apologize for not being here early yesterday afternoon. I was doing new teacher uh, professional development and um, hopefully uh, informing them and scaring them in equal measure to make sure that we're not posting inappropriate things on social media and that we're not sexually harassing one another. So um, again, I, I apologize for that. So I missed a lot of the conversation regarding uh, the eight period a day. Um, one of the things that, that we had discussed that um, we would like to um, propose on that is including a sunset on that provision. Um, it's my understanding that one of the uh, items that was brought up was that we don't really have any data to support that it would be good for students, um, even though that is, that is the belief, um, and that it would give them more opportunities, that we wouldn't have an excess of uh, early graduation, all of those um, concerns were raised. Uh, so really the only way you're going to get data is if you do it. Um, a sunset allows it to be tried on a pilot basis, um, and then it is automatically removed from the agreement unless agreed to um, after the, the sunset. Uh, so after discussions, the sunset would be after three school years, is that correct, Paul? So that would be through the 2024-2025 school year, so 2022-23, 23-24, 24-25. That should give everyone adequate opportunity to uh, gather data um, and really immerse themselves um, in uh, you know, retrieving credits, those types of things, um, and, and really be able to, to give the uh, the new scheduling um, yeah, fair shot. So um, I have the language drafted. I just don't have it printed out. So we will get back to you. Okay. Thank you for uh, your response and a possible solution that uh, might get us past the not yet that we talked about yesterday. And we will certainly consider that when we're in caucus. And you're welcome to just email me the Oh, document right. for now if you'd like just right. l evans at tps that would work for right now if you'd like to just go oh, well, instead of worrying about copies perfect thank so, you thank you Would TCALC also be on the eight period schedule? <coughs> they would have a schedule that is aligned to the schedules that we presented as options. Um, they don't currently function on a seven period day. Um, kids come there for the morning for two and a half hours, for two and a half hours in the afternoon. Um, but the way the uh, sample schedules were created, 
um, it allows for uh, all it allows all three of those schedules allow for some flexibility at each school um, and still maintain the same time frames so kids uh, can go to TCAL and or WIT and return. The reason I ask is that currently in, in my building anyway, students sit in our library during an instructional period while they're waiting for transportation to TCAL. And so they're actually losing um, time that could be direct instruction. And I just wondered the impact of an eight hour schedule. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that clarification. <coughs> Else. But that, I, I assume have to ask. I assume that option would then be available to Hope Street and Cap City students as well. Well, I, Hope Street and Cap City, you know, that would be available to them as well. Okay, thank you. They, but you also pointed out yeah, they, they are also kind of right. Their schedules are different, but it would be an option should that be useful. Okay. And they, they have to get within, so yeah. Okay. Any other lingering issues, or shall we go forward? Go forward. The word in my head is march on, but go forward. Okay, as I said to you yesterday, we are going to uh, share with you uh, enhancements or monetary uh, requests being made on the part of our team and our constituency. Um, and so we have language for them. I will think, uh, we'll, we'll share the language with you. I will have the rationale from the member of the team that is the expert in that field. And uh, and I think at the close of that, <coughs> if you have anything uh, that you want to share, that would be welcome or we will probably come at that point. Okay. All right, the first... Uh, <coughs> It is Article 36, Elementary Addenda. The association is requesting that the elementary agenda under Article 36 increase from the current 550 to uh, 1100, so essentially doubling the amount. What's about? It's about. Okay, it's about. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Trying to read. Trying to read the um, just to help both sides of the table i am on page 60 of the professional agreement so the current agenda for elementary is 550 dollars uh, that was uh, voted on and approved by this these, this organization both sides of the table in 2015. Uh, we are now approaching the 2021-2022 school year, and the um, job of being an elementary school teacher has become dramatically more complex over the last six years, um, which I think both sides of the table are aware of, uh, just based on data collection itself. Um, so uh, that is our request that we are making. The language is pretty straightforward and increased. 550 to 1,000, the approximate uh, cost to the district, and these are just very round figures. We have about 600 elementary school teachers, uh, and so the total price tag on this is about $270,000. Uh, 
for the rationale, I'm going to turn my microphone over to Jermaine, who will talk about what the elementary school day looks like and reasons why we would make this request. Um, as we all know, those who have been on the committee um, and negotiations, this is the third year that we have asked about this, addressed this. So it's uh, not exactly a, a laundry list. It's something that we uh, left and came back with. Um, particularly this year, um, we all know that it, it's been challenging for everyone. Um, for the elementary school teacher, we um, we are under the gun. Not only do we have children, particularly this year, that have learning losses, we are going to have to um, start with doing diagnostic testing to find out their learning losses and continue from there. We also have a group of kids that um, have not been in school. Uh, except for a portion of last year. Um, mentally, uh, it, I can say at my school, the mental impact has been huge. Um, there was a lot of uh, times when we had to meet before and after school on certain students because of the situations that they were in. Um, I'm not going to go through remote teaching because it looks like we will not be having that. But Times have changed, and we are starting to teach one-to-one uh, -one on our Chromebooks. So there's the instruction with that. We've also had new uh, platforms that we have had to learn. Uh, we've learned uh, Seesaw. We've learned um, we have to start with data cycles. We've got the Google Classroom, which we weren't allowed to use last year. Hopefully that will come back. Uh, Moby Max, um, everything that the district last year wanted us to use, we were required to go to a professional development and learn this. So, and this was probably two weeks before. I mean, we had time over the summer, but we just weren't sure what we had to learn, and it was kind of just thrown at us. And there was a lot of extra time that we had to spend on this. Most importantly this year, we're going to have to differentiate our instruction. Um, we also, with our SPED kids and our uh, ESL kids, which I have learned that 50% of my class this year will be SPED, um, that, will all have, that will have to be differentiated as well. And <clears throat> I, we have done that before. It's not like we haven't. But we're, we're working with a group of kids that, are, that have been back, though, and we're trying to bring them forward. Um, all teachers, as required last year, and I assume we're going to do the same this year, we all in our PLC need to have the same lesson plans according to the CPM of the district. Um, so it's meeting intently with our PLC and deciding what are we going to teach today, what are the standards we're going to teach, um, what are we going to do with this group of kids that are not caught up yet, um, what uh, are we going to put in our grade books, what are we going to use for data. Um, that all has changed continually every year. It is uh, understandable, but something has been added to our plate. Um, the three-tier system, we are we use that as well. We also um, are doing the screener, the, the, C, the CI3T, we use that screener to check our mental health. And trying to get everything done during the day, trying to leave at, the, at 4 o'clock, that just doesn't happen. There has to be time during the day that we have to call parents. Uh, this year, email parents. We have to meet with the social worker. We also have, like this year, I'm looking at uh, doing 11 GEIs or, uh, I'm sorry, yes, GEIs, and going to those meetings. Those meetings usually aren't during the day. They're before and after school. I'm required to be there, and I want to be there. Um, as we all know, we do have an agenda right now of 550. Um, 
not to complain. I know the middle school and high school have things that they need to talk about in their collaboration. And we do as well. And we use our collaboration on the late starts from the time we get there to the time that we leave. We usually have a staff meeting, then we go to our PLCs, and it's usually, everything is data driven. So at that time, planning is not done. And then we have to find a time during the day to do this plan. And we do not have the two collaboration period as the high school does. So we have to find time in the morning or after school to get this, these plans done. And often I have to tell you, um, I do very well with the group that I have. So later on at night and usually Sunday afternoons, we're texting, we're on our computers, we're making sure we have everything loaded into Seesaw. Um, we never know if what kids we're gonna have that day. Looking at this year, there's so many unknowns. We may be back to kids that don't want to return to school. Um, but, and we'll have to, or they'll just come part of the time. And we'll have to make sure that we have everything loaded, everything graded, and it's a lot of record keeping. Um, going back to uh, last year or previous years, the extra collaboration um, kind of did some figures on that. And the extra collaboration that boils down to a class period um, actually comes out to be, if you look at it, we took just the, the base salary, divided it by the contract days, went through an eight hour day, found that out, what a quarter of an hour would be, what a 45 minute plan would be, um, times the number of days that we are in school teaching, and that's about $3,775.20 that if you're looking at it monetarily, that we are missing out on because we do not have that extra collaboration. So I think when we ask the district to soften the blow, $1,000 in reflection to that piece is not huge to me. Um, so I am asking um, primarily also for the, those new teachers that are coming in. They don't know what's they don't know what's going to hit them. They're, they are really overwhelmed. We spend a lot of time during the day telling them, "Okay, we do this. We do these shortcuts. We do this." And they're like, is this worth it? We don't even know if this is worth it. And it would be nice to have in my pocket. Well, we do get that $1,000 agenda. And that's because we're doing all of this extra work and we're meeting and we're, we're doing it outside of the school day. So it kind of softens the blow because we have a lot of new teachers that are frantic. And we want them to stay. Um, I think we have to agree also in our district, as I've said before, we have a lot of children that have some mental health issues. They, they don't come from the best environments. So we are at the beginning of the day. I spend the first hour of the day when I do have plans, uh, you know, someone has come in, they're upset, or I find out something's happened in the neighborhood, or I find out, I, I'm not trying to say, a pity party thing. This is just what we do. And children do not have the ability to go through their uh, emotions and feelings and figure out what's going on with them. They just react. It's fight or flight. So elementary teachers work their tails off. And we do it for the kids. But I think it would certainly help to be acknowledge what we do and be uh, compensated for a part of what we do. Since the last time that we had an increase, which was 2015, this job has changed dramatically. And we've been asked to do, because I have been with this district for 28 years, we've been asked to do every single year, not having any kind of negotiation on it, but told, you need to learn this. You need to learn this. You need to be doing this. 
whether or not we agree, that's what we're asked to do, and I do it. But I will have to say it comes with a cost. So thank you for listening. I do appreciate your listening. Every year we seem to come with this litany of lists, and uh, this is important. And this is what will help our school retain good teachers. Thank you. <clears throat> add just a little bit before I open for questions from your side. <clears throat> Passionate responses from her side as an elementary school teacher. Um, I had the opportunity this last year to watch what the elementary school teachers did because of the remote learning. Um, I had a seven-year-old granddaughter, six-year-old, seven-year-old, so first grade. I had in my house while I was remote teaching my granddaughter as well. Um, she is a group in a group of students that we are very concerned about because she missed the fourth, the last quarter of kindergarten and then first grade was in and out. Um, and I, I will say that on the part uh, on my part as the parent in, in this scenario, um, it, it was a Herculean effort on my part to make sure that she did all of her work, that she moved forward, that she successfully met uh, the standards uh, uh, that her first grade teacher set up. And I'm happy to say that she did. But I got to watch that first grade teacher every day teach her class of students. And I saw the level of frustration, the children who didn't show up, the children who didn't have the same support system behind that they did. And yet that first grade teacher, and it's a teacher Robert McCarter, I, she, she was my hero the whole entire time. She continued to move mountains in order to move children. She used the technology, which I, I have to thank the district for, all that was put in place. It was an amazing thing to watch. Um, I will also say that I had other grandchildren who chose, uh, their parents chose the virtual learning model for the whole year. And so those grandchildren were in fourth grade classes of 200 kids. I was horrified by that. Um, but uh, those children be, made it through as well. But to watch my granddaughter use the tools that Topeka Public Schools provided for the elementary school teachers was impressive. To see the lessons that the teachers put together was impressive. We I don't know how many parents in the district went to the above and beyond, but we did the music lessons, we did the PE lessons, we did the science, we did the social studies, we did all the extra stuff. And I think kudos to Sarah Sharp for this, all those extra wonderful things that were out there. So we weren't just sitting in front of a screen for 45 minutes and just being beat over the head with math and language arts. We did all of those other things too. And that took a great deal of effort on the part of our PE teachers in our district, our art teachers in our district, our music teachers in our district. Um, even at one point in time, my granddaughter felt like giving up. And so we knew we could call the school counselor, and she did. And the counselor picked up her phone and talked to my granddaughter for 20 minutes and, and helped her through a difficult time. I mean, this, this stuff brings tears to my eyes. I was super impressed with Topeka Public Schools. But the, the, the reason why I was super impressed is because your side of the table decided to provide these resources for the teachers. And they were amazing. And I hope they continue. And then our side of the table took those tools, some of which they'd never used before, and implemented it in, in a way that looked flawless. I knew behind the scenes that it wasn't flawless, but for the children and the parents sitting in front of that screen, it looked flawless. That took a Herculean effort on the part of our elementary school teachers to be able to do that. I was so impressed with what I saw. So as we talk about the elementary school teachers and what they do, Jermaine is able to talk about the logistics, the, the data collection, the, the aligned lesson plans, and all those other things. What I saw as a parent was that learning was happening in our district. Because regardless of what happened, 
whether the children were at home, whether they were at school, whatever was going on, our teachers came forward, not because they knew they were going to get paid extra money, not for any of those reasons. They did it for our children. You put out the money on the programs and did the training and teaching for our kids because we are a children first district. So all we're asking at this point in time is let's recognize the effort that these teachers put forward. Let's encourage them to continue those efforts. We're not done yet. We don't know 100%, but we do know that learning loss is there. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we've had the discussion at our table with our elementary teachers. We're worried about those second graders. We are. And they're going to be third graders next year. And it's going to take a lot of work on the part of our elementary school teachers to pull them forward, to bring them to where they need to be. Because as a high school teacher, I'm going to tell you that the kids I have in my room are amazing. And they're amazing, whether they're special education kids, whether they're English language learners, gen ed kids, they're amazing because of the job the elementary school teachers do, because of the job the middle school teachers do. I never have discipline problems in my room, ever. I'm able to determine very quickly how my students are going to learn and how I can help them and where I can meet them at. Because they come in my classroom and they're students. They know how to be students. And they know how to do that because of the work that's happened before. It's not anything that I see. It's just something that's happened because of a Herculean effort on the part of elementary and middle. Those are the kids I see. So when we talk about being a district that puts children first, when we talk about the importance of those foundational years, K through three, I realize you teach fifth grade, but K through three is huge. Mm -hmm. I know if a child is not reading on grade level by the end of third grade, they never will. They can become better readers, but they will never read on grade level. Just that thought itself lets me know that the kindergarten, first, second, and third grade teachers that will be entering our buildings next week have a huge task ahead of them. So let's please not just throw this to the side. It is a third year. I understand that finances are tough. I get all of that. But let's understand the task we're asking these teachers to do. It's going to be difficult, but they've already proven to me that they can be amazing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, one question that has been brought up by the team, when were Chromebooks added to our curriculum? We have had Chromebooks now for uh, two years, but we weren't in a one-to-one -one situation. Uh, we were asked to, we use the Chromebooks all the time now. We use it for every subject. And so we had to learn the in and outs of Chromebooks. So it, that's been a huge effort um, on both the kids and our part. The one thing I'd like to add is we know there are a shortage of teachers out there. We know there are because we see it in our buildings and we see those early teachers become very upset and very frustrated. And I'm part of training those teachers and then they go on to take a job in 501. And I'm often asked, hey, they have jobs at Washington Rural. They have jobs at Shawnee Heights. It's not near, you know, my so-and-so teachers out there and they don't seem to have the constant coming out them. And my reply is, uh, we make a good salary. We are compensated. Uh, 501 does do excellent training. It's something that we, you need to stick with and get a few years under your belt and then decide if that's the way that you want to go. But um, I would agree, and I think my team would too, that if elementary is compensated, not just the fourth of you that we're asking for, but compensated, then they're more willing to stay. So thank you for listening. Any questions or uh, 
comments from your side at this point in time. I don't think we really have any questions. Um, I will acknowledge uh, whether we're talking about elementary teachers, secondary teachers, or whatever the case may be. Uh, there is a great amount of appreciation on this side of the table for what our teachers do each and every day. It is a noble profession. Uh, I will be the first to attest to that. Uh, so just because you may not hear a lot of comments on this side, please don't misinterpret that uh, for lack of appreciation or acknowledgement for the job that our uh, certified staff uh, does in people public schools. Uh, we're going to listen very intently and quietly uh, because I know that you have a list of of the uh, request that you're going to be going through. Uh, the only thing that I ask you to keep in mind, and you kind of alluded to it, uh, Lucinda, is that we only have so many dollars to work with. And we are going to spend those in a way that we feel we can get the biggest bang for the buck for those dollars. I think that we have demonstrated in uh, the past that we do everything that we can with the limited financial resources that we have to acknowledge through the compensation that we uh, offer uh, that we greatly appreciate uh, what our staff does. Uh, and we will continue to do that uh, within the resources that we have available. Uh, we're going to do as much as we can. Uh, I just don't know how realistic it is for there to be an expectation that we're going to be able to touch and satisfy every request that is shared with us. Uh, I think uh, Gary did a very good job of painting what our financial picture is. But I think we also have a history that attests to the fact that at the Beacon Public Schools, we're very interested in making sure that we are leaders when it comes to uh, compensation. Uh, when it comes to teaching and the profession itself, it's a profession that certainly is not uh, rewarded monetarily uh, as it should be. Uh, it never has. If we will ever get to that point, uh, remains to be seen. I don't know. Uh, but uh, for what you do in helping to educate kids and prepare the leaders, whether they're government leaders or business leaders of tomorrow, um, I think uh, is, uh, you, you can't speak highly enough for anyone who enters a teaching profession. Uh, so, you know, we do uh, acknowledge uh, everything that's already been said, uh, probably everything that uh, is yet to be said. Uh, but just because you may not hear a lot of comments uh, doesn't mean that we don't appreciate and recognize uh, contribution. One thing that I might uh, have you take a look at for your own reference is this proposal. We talked about the flat rate at the uh, Well, it should be 15. Oh. We want to make that correction on your on your sheets. We'll make it on ours. Okay. Thank you. Just at the top. It's Oh. I just had a quick question. Um, 
given that preschool and Head Start teachers do all of the things that you listed, I'm curious why they weren't included in your request. At this point in time in the contract, it's not, it says the contract is, is specifically elementary teachers. Uh, we would like to add preschool or the pre-K teachers into the list, but as we pointed out at the beginning, this is the third year we've asked for elementary. So we kind of like to add things incrementally. So right now we are making the request for elementary. And, and once this is successful, then we of course will delve into the pre-K group as well. Thank you for that question. Thank you for advocating. set the stage we have four requests total one three more to go so we have kind of a numeric i mentioned the other day one of the uh, items that we had on our letter i had pulled uh, for uh, the reasons i mentioned to you um, so we're going to talk about the uh, middle school activities coordinators now this is article 36 other differentials it Starts in the professional contract on page 57, but very quickly moves over to page 58. It's kind of at the bottom of 57, top of 58. Brenda will hand you our language. brought this to the table last year and we're, we're partially successful in getting an increase um, in the agenda for our high school activities coordinators. Um, so I bring back to the table the middle school activities coordinators and can request once again. Uh, you can see by looking at the uh, document in front of you, the current rate uh, is 13.6% of the base. We're asking for an increase of 26% of the base, which is the same thing we asked for the high school ADs last year. This year we come to the table asking for middle school ADs. And before I launch into my narrative over why I believe that this group of, of, of educators uh, deserves an increase in pay, I will point out a couple of different things. One is Topeka Public Schools was able to celebrate earlier this spring um, the success of one of our Topeka High athletes who was drafted into the NFL. And I would point out that that Topeka High athlete started as a middle school seventh grader playing football and the coaches that touched that young man's life as he went through middle school and high school helped prepare him uh, for college and beyond and made it possible for us to celebrate uh, that young man's success uh, in the NFL and it was a big deal and it's a caveat to speak of public schools to say that this young man was one of ours and uh, uh, basically achieve that dream that so many of our kids on the athletic field um, always dream about. Uh, so his success would not have been possible without his coaches, but his coaches would not exist without the activities coordinators that were working behind the scenes along the way. I would also mention that we had another celebration this spring where the Topeka High School softball team won a 6A state championship. Um, in, in softball. Uh, I had the opportunity to, as many of us did, watch them all spring. An amazing, amazing group of girls um, who uh, did amazing things, uh, not only on the field, but also off the field. If there was ever a definition of a student athlete, it's every single one of those girls who took the field every day. And we were fortunate enough to be given the, the time off, if you will, to go watch them win that championship game, and I was there with them. Those same girls who played softball for us 
Many of them were on our basketball team who also took second in state. And I can tell you that as a coach at Eisenhower Middle School, I coached against many of those girls when they played at Jardine and Landon. And they were impressive then. Um, so we really have created a culture of academic and athletic success in our district. And I am very proud of that. I hope that everybody is. I mean, these are, these are amazing kids. And I can't believe I get to work with them on a regular basis uh, in the classroom and in the school uh, because of the fact that they are, they are so stunning. And so I point out again that none of this would happen without the support of middle school athletics. Seventh grade is the first time a child will turn step onto a field in which competition will be against other schools. That type of competition that is so important to building the student, the, the fully rounded student. And again, each and every time the uh, activities coordinators are behind the scenes doing amazing things. And I have not done the math, I could. I would love to take the years that our middle school ADs have done their jobs uh, at our various middle schools. Tim Wilson has been at French forever. Brenda has been over at Chase forever. Uh, Katie is relatively new at Landon, but she's been involved, when I say new, within the last five years. Um, so we've got ADs that have been doing this job for years uh, in dedication to the students at their schools. So. That being said, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the changes that have happened in their lives over the last 10 years um, since this agenda has changed. In recent years, this organization, both sides of the table, have agreed to ask, add cross country and soccer to middle school athletics. Uh, middle school ADs write contracts for out of district schools. When I first started coaching, we only played against the other schools in the district. We now play against Junction City, we play against uh, private schools, Care Parable. The point is that middle school athletes get that more high school experience. This was an initiative driven by the middle school uh, activities coordinators, uh, but it has become very successful. Uh, we've played against Kip Academy. We've played against Blue Valley. We've had Lawrence invited to invitationals. Uh, so giving our kids a, a, a better uh, collegiate or intercollegiate experience by going outside of the school district. But all of that takes time and organization and contracts. Um, because we have made our middle school athletics more competitive, it, it, it was uh, everybody gets to play when I was there, and now we are a little bit more competitive. Uh, we also feel like that level of competition requires medals, trophies, and invitationals that are held on Saturdays. And so those are purchased out of essentially the gate money to any of these athletic events. They've also organized invitationals, mid-season tournaments, round robin tournaments, and of course, end of season tournaments. Uh, again, I will go back to when I was first coaching, there were no end of season tournaments. We just simply were done. Now there is a major event that is very important to our student athletes, all coordinated by the ADs. And if you've ever had the opportunity to go to uh, a championship night, where the top four teams will be competing against each other, you'll see every single middle school AD in the house. They're all there, keeping an eye on their own kids who have come to watch the athletes play, but also making sure that um, the, the competitions run fairly and effectively. Uh, they hire all officials for regular season games. I might point out that last year they had to contact all those officials because there were no regular season games. Um, they are at school at least four nights a week. And when I say that, that's middle school as well as high school ADs. There's a lot of after hours work that has to be done. Middle school ADs work at least seven Saturdays a year. This is because of invitationals, mid-season tournaments, and end-of-season tournaments, in addition to the fact that cross-country events are run on Saturdays. Um, those are uh, uh, something new that was added with cross-country. Over the last decade, the number of games, meets for uh, basketball, volleyball, and track has doubled. Okay, All of our middle schools, with the exception of Eisenhower, teach half-time. So they're hiring the officials. They're scheduling the invitations. 
they're planning the 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 officials uh, uh, lounge area if you will they're they're coordinating with coaches both in our district and out of our district to put together those invitations those mid-season tournaments they're doing all of that but they're teaching half a day uh, the only middle school AD that doesn't teach half a day is Eisenhower and he actually spends half of his day uh, in administrative capacity and then the other half of his day as an AD um, none of our middle school coordinators have a designated administrative assistant person who helps them with all of the uh, purchasing uh, documents paperwork contracts is the middle school senior office assistant or office administrative assistant there, there is not uh, anybody who handles that clerical work for them a lot of them they do on their own uh, whereas the high school do have clerical support um, hiring extra workers to work at sporting events is also very difficult it's a it's a task that um, um, is kind of their headache constantly people to take money at the gate people to cut the books people to do the clock um, uh, all of the different things supervising the stands um, i will point out that most of the people who do that by the way are our pair educators uh, for our parents it kind of becomes their part-time job and they do a great job at it um, and of course they have to be at every event uh, high schools will have enough personnel to be able to split up the responsibilities of being at every event, but middle school ladies have to be at every single event. Uh, and then in their spare time, they do bus duty because at the middle school level, uh, we do a little bit of supervision, but not much. The ADs are out there every day organizing the buses, making sure the kids get there on time and handling bus discipline issues as they arise. They also are responsible for lockers and locker assignments. They also handle discipline, whether it's discipline for an athlete or just overload from uh, a very difficult day. Uh, they often will handle um, uh, technology issues as they're related to programs used in sporting events. Uh, they are also certified CPR trainers for all the coaches. I got my letter yesterday that my CPR training is supposed to be this week. I don't think that's going to happen, but uh, at any rate, uh, CPR training is coordinated by them. So all of those things that they did, and then, you know, you threw last year at them, not, not you, the world threw last year at them. And so um, this year was a particularly difficult year. They tried really hard. I talk to them quite often. These people are also <laughs> um, about what was happening in the middle schools, because I do worry about middle school athletics. Um, that actually helps many of our students be more successful in the classroom when they have an outlet, uh, an athletic outlet of some kind. Uh, I always worry about middle school kids who just go home at the end of the school day because they don't always make the best choices. And so the more students we can have participating in our programs, the better we are. When I started at Eisenhower, our volleyball program the year before I was there had nine athletes. Um, when I turned the coaching over to another teacher as I was moving on to the high school, I was at that point in time having 45 girls a day. Um, so an extra 36 students were staying after school and not uh, going out and making bad decisions. So it, these middle school athletic programs are hugely important. So this year they tried in the murals. They tried. They tried incentive. They tried providing transportation. Uh, but the kids would be in and then they'd not be in. It was difficult at the high school. It was super difficult at the middle school level. High school kids can drive. Middle school kids can't. So in addition to all the other challenges, trying to get the kids to school uh, when we weren't in school to participate in any kind of after school activities was difficult. They were on the phone constantly emailing, promoting their programs, trying to get the kids in. And frankly, I'm a little worried moving forward about what our high school athletic programs will look like this year and next year because our seventh and eighth graders were not properly indoctrinated into a formal school athletic program. They just weren't. Um, and so uh, the middle school ADs will be working harder uh, this year and next year to bring kids out. And our high school coaches will be working harder too because there's that gap in learning. That learning loss occurs on the athletic field as well. So they're going to be working uh, more difficult um, to try and get kids out and, and that they worked overtime last year. That's not going to happen again. Um, we are all, I know, optimistic that children will be in school every day. That makes it easier for middle school athletic programs to be successful. But again, 
Uh, they are teachers, they are educators, they are managers, and they are uh, they, clerical specialists, they're IT specialists, they do it all. They've been here forever. Uh, most of them have taken on the task and stayed for many, many years and, and more than 20 years on the job. So again, we're asking for um, a 26% increase. The total dollar amount for the six ADs is just six uh, uh, middle school ADs. The dollar amount is around $36,000. The increased cost is around $36,000. I don't think there's any questions. Moving on to item number three on our agenda is uh, TH tech assistance. Friend again, this is um, Oh. Hours and amounts of work. We talked yesterday about the librarians um, getting additional um, uh, getting additional uh, days to work. Now these are the technology assistants, which sometimes are librarians and sometimes are not. Uh, when we first started uh, using technology technology in the classroom. The TAs were often librarians, um, but since then it has expanded beyond them, um, be, beyond just the librarian. So it, it could be a librarian, it could be a classroom teacher in the building, it could be a counselor. Um, when we had curriculum coordinators, it was a curriculum coordinator, but basically the technology assistant. So it's in Article 36, so I pretty much stay on the same page that I did with the elementary. We're on page 60, and if you'll notice in there, High school, middle school, and elementary school technology assistants uh, do already have an agenda in place. It's a thousand dollars per building. Our language change is to make it a thousand dollars per person, and we are recommending that each building have two technology assistants, um, and that each of those people is paid a thousand dollars. Currently, the cost for the technology assistance is about $22,000. I'm actually going to turn this over to Tiffany because uh, I think she's got dollars and cents and rationale for you on technology assistance. I'm going to try and keep this pretty brief. Um, I feel like we've talked about technology a lot. Um, and the technology assistant role, it's sort of um, a difficult role to talk about because it means different things for different people. Um, and the reason we're requesting for this to change to per person is simply because in larger buildings, we have to split this role. So I split this role with another person. Um, and I'm doing the same amount of work as um, a TA would be doing maybe at Stout Elementary, which is a relatively small building. Um, so we don't find that to be very equitable. Um, what we're just asking for is just simply doubling the amount that TAs receive um, from this addenda. So the new total expenditure would be $45,000 and just a difference of $22,500. Um, LR, I handed you a copy of the job description for the technology assistant. Um, I'm not going to read through all of that. But it was 16 different duties. Um, and when you look at some of the job descriptions for other um, roles that receive addenda, um, they're not as lengthy and they're not as time consuming. Um, I believe for an instructional coach, there are six job duties that are listed. Um, and so for this one, it's been a challenge to be a technology assistant in the past year and a half. Uh, but prior to that, it was difficult. Um, especially as your technology assistants are also full-time instructional staff, um, so they're they're teaching full-time. 
and we know that technology issues arise during the instructional day. So we have to balance teaching while also um, working really diligently to assist staff and students who are having technical issues in the moment. Um, I have a, a very brief list of five talking points um, that, that I believe are pretty good rationale for taking a look at this dollar amount. Um, my first point is that the, uh, the dollar amount for this role was established um, based on the information that I have 20 plus years ago. Um, and we know, especially after our discussions this week, that there's been an incredible addition of technology since then. Um, we have updated the job description for TA, but we have not updated the monetary compensation. Um, the TA role, this is my second point, the TA role, it includes near daily technical support um, for students and staff as we are the immediate what we call end user support. So many buildings in the district do not have a technician, uh, that they don't have a home school. Um, so especially at the elementary level, when you have librarians and TAs who are teaching full time and we don't have anyone in the building to assist someone when their projector goes down. Um, it becomes kind of in a, a stressful situation. Um, my third point is there's been a staggering increase in the, just simply the number of physical um, pieces of technology. Um, so that's not even considering the additional platforms that we've added in the past five years. Um, so just, just simply taking care of the physical devices themselves is an extensive amount of work. Um, which leads me to the fourth point. So there's a substantial increase in the amount of work, and that includes immediate troubleshooting. That's the component that's really challenging. Um, if someone has you know, an issue, we try to um, assist them as quickly as possible, which becomes, it can um, create sort of a forensic environment. Um, and I kind of alluded to this already, but this job description, it was 16 duties for $500. Um, well, we have other agenda duties that average simply between five or ten duties, and some of those um, agenda, which, you know, for some of them, like we, we've talked about the assistant tenants coach, which is a seasonal obligation, um, those individuals can make up to $4,400 a year for, you know, a short period of time, whereas a TA, if they're doing it correctly, um, that's an everyday demand on their time and their energy. Um, so, like I said, I wanted to keep it brief. But this is something that um, I think is pretty important um, in terms of protecting our investment in technology, which is something I spoke about on Monday. Uh, because what we end up seeing is people who are TAs, they realize that it's not worth their time. And so what we, what we end up having are TAs who get burnt out, and then you have a building that is left with very little technical support, um, which puts a lot of pressure on the IT department, which is something that uh, Mr. Makey alluded to yesterday. Um, so, I think this would be something that would keep the TAs that we already have in place, um, give them an, an incentive to continue fulfilling this role. Tiffany, what did you say the additional cost was? So, as we are just asking to double the addendum, the additional cost would be the same as the current expenditure. So, it would be $22,500. Additional dollars, so the new total new expenditure would be forty five thousand. But because we're just asking to double it, and I I would kind of argue that. But aren't you doing more than double it? If right now, if it's set up per building, but you want to increase it, you want to do it per person, but you're doubling the number of people. We already have, um, and, and this is, it gets tricky to talk about because not all buildings have two TAs and not, you know, it's it's difficult to come up with exact numbers. Um, Based on the fact that there are 45 TAs right now. Yeah, we wouldn't change the number of TAs at all, if that makes sense. We already have two TAs, so it's difficult to think about because this, I don't get $1,000 as a TA. I split that agenda with another individual. Um, so we're not doubling the amount of TAs. We're not asking for any additional TAs to be added. Okay, but if, if you split it right now with another TA, then both of you are receiving 
And you want to increase that to a thousand per person. And not all buildings have two PAs. Right. But as Ms. Cope was saying, is that basically if you're the only one in a building, then you don't receive an increase. Which I would argue makes sense because those individuals are already receiving a thousand dollars. So I think what he wants to know is how many people only receive five hundred dollars right now. So how much I don't that have is. that information and I think it would you know, it would be difficult to get that information to figure out how many individuals don't split that agenda because it really is a building decision. Um, I I received the full agenda amount one year and realized it was very unrealistic for a building of the, the size that I was in. Uh, but we're like I said, we're when you think about we only have forty five TAs. We're not asking to. Um, increase you know the amount of TAs and the expenditure we could try and go and figure out how many TAs do not slip this this dollar amount and really get you know down to the dollar but um, there there are a lot of things that I believe need to be cleaned up when we think about this role because it becomes difficult to talk about dollar amounts um, because we aren't sure exactly who's doing what where and it fluctuates from year to year, depending on um, how many people are willing to be TAs because it's a voluntary role, for the most part. Yeah. <laughs> it's a voluntary role. I would say, LR, in kind of an answer to your question, <clears throat> when we started talking about this uh, as an organization, we thought they might try and dial down and figure, you know, how many TAs a school like Stout might need as opposed to a Scott or a Meadows or HPC. We we understand there are there are huge differences in numbers of students and therefore numbers of devices in the building. Um, but we decided to let go of that piece of the argument because it was really hard to nail down um, exactly, you know, for, for us to decide that a building with 200 should have one TA and maybe a building with 400 should have two. That was, that was difficult for us to actually uh, decide. So we backed off of being that specific and simply saying that uh, it, instead of it being a per building agenda, perhaps it should be a per person agenda. Um, and as Tiffany pointed out very well, that the better uh, a job our TAs do, and she pointed out, and you were at what elementary school has it? Scott, she was at Scott. She was at one of our bigger schools. Um, the better a job our TAs are able, the, the better our TAs are able to do their job. My goodness, can you tell an English teacher? All right. Um, <laughs> the uh, the better job we can do of protecting uh, an investment, which, as Gary pointed out the other day, has become rather expensive from when we first started buying Chromebooks. Uh, these are the frontline people who fix all those little problems before they become big problems. Uh, but they've got to have the time, the personnel to do it, and uh, we believe they should have the compensation for it as well. It is a special skill. It's not one I would take on. I always say I know enough about computers to be dangerous, and that's it. Um, so it, it's quite a task, and it does shift in buildings because people do get burnt out pretty quickly or frustrated. Uh, they're trying to do their 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 main task, whatever it may be, librarian, counselor, classroom teacher, and they're constantly being interrupted by uh, issues that come up because everybody in that building has a device in their hands. Uh, and again, I know that uh, the TAs were our front line this year as best as they could do it with all of the new technology changes that we had at all grade levels. Again, we added uh, a number of programs, there was a number of trainings out there, the trainings were great, but from time to time, you need that person on the ground. Um, and I could say that 
last year and part of this year, one of our TA's main job was to help us with Tyler Sims. That That's a big one. Mm -hmm. That That's a big one. Uh, we're, we're better at it. When it first came along, you know, it was problematic and uh, really, really challenging for our TAs. Um, we've since built kind of a community of staff in our building who know something about Tyler Sis and can help those who are not as skilled problem solve, but that, that's a big one. Um, when you look at our proposed language change, it looks very simple. Um, and we intentionally kept it that way as opposed to, as listen and mention, um, we really did go through all the numbers and looked at how many buildings we have. Um, and we want to keep it simple simply because presently um, there's nothing formal that states you can split the addenda or that you should split the addenda or I think that's something that has been, that decision has been made informally by building administrators as well as the TAs themselves who can't, who simply can't handle um, doing it alone. So we intentionally kept it simple and it, it is, I think, um, you know, we could get really, really specific with it, but to allow for building administrators and the TAs themselves to have some flexibility in determining, um, you know, how, how many TAs they might need. Um, and also leaving that up to the IT department and determining that as well. So it, this is a monetary request, but it's a little difficult to pin down, you know, right to the dollar simply because it's a fluid situation. Um, so that's all. Any other questions? Filled this space with a lot of words. Uh, moving on to our last request, I'm going to refer you to Article 29, which is on page 43, and the professional agreement, multiple building assignments, and travel reimbursement. We have actually added a little bit more to the title of that um, article in our new language. Uh, the language that's in black, of course, is already in the uh, district, uh, or already in the contract. The language in red, we pulled from district documents, board documents. There is already uh, language in uh, the district guiding documents for travel reimbursement. We are simply asking that it be inserted into the professional contract as well. So. Uh, in a year where multiple home visits were made, and I'm sure you guys are aware of that, I made home visits myself. Uh, uh, a lot of people uh, were out and about trying to find the children that weren't showing up uh, on the Zoom or in person, uh, being concerned about their well-being, uh, but also uh, trying to make sure that uh, we were in compliance with the law. So uh, we, we knocked on doors. We all did. And so some of our staff members who went knocking on doors didn't realize that there was a reimbursement clause in uh, district language for mileage uh, expended to go visit these homes. Uh, so the piece that we have added uh, comes from, uh, is it 2100-3, I believe? Yeah. One of the board docs comes from, if we, we uh, worked with the language, just the, with the wording just a little bit, but... Uh, professional employees in the bargaining unit assigned to more than one building is the way it's originally described. That's the multiple building assignments. As determined by the superintendent and his or her designee, shall be reimbursed at the prevailing rate established by the Internal Revenue Service. That piece is in place because, as we all know, 
music teachers travel from building to building. Uh, we, we've got other uh, people in the building who move from one place to another. I believe we mentioned TAs that might cover more than one building or IT people that cover more than one building. So we, we do have people in general where a part of their job description is moving from building to building. And so that piece is in place and has been in place for a while. Now we're making sure or kind of reinforcing the idea that faculty members who travel on pre-approved school-related business okay, will be reimbursed by the board subject to the following. Travel between buildings in accordance to mileage between buildings within the district or travel is between the building assigned and an identified address for the student when performing home visits with students, parents, and approved by administration. So we're going to be very careful with this. Uh, administration is, is uh, aware when we are going to visit homes and, and, and make those, those home visits. Uh, but uh, reimbursement shall be in, court, in accordance with the mileage chart prepared by the district, provided by the provided the professional employee completes a voucher form furnished by the district, verified by signature, the use of a vehicle during school days. The form shall be delivered to the business office by the 15th day of the month, following the month in which travel expenses occur. So again, we're just taking language from Ford docs and uh, asking that it be inserted into the um, language of the, of the professional agreement itself. Um, mainly because this was uh, an, an issue this year, home visits. And I'm, I'm going to let Jeremy kind of talk about this for a minute because I know he was involved in the home visits because of his job description. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I'll be great. Okay, I'll, I'll just speak for a while then. Um, in working with uh, my uh, my colleagues, uh, colleagues that are at Avondale, and also with my virtual students, uh, one of the requests that was made upon us was to do home visits because I want to log in, particularly for our, our, uh, our, our virtual students. I, do, I didn't do too much with Avondale. I, I just I had colleagues that were there, and they were explaining to me the intent of their home business and getting kids back in school and back into uh, uh, the routine of uh, what it is that we do, right? And so, one of the questions I asked was, Are we getting reimbursed for mileage in the cars? And some had, had said that they weren't concerned. Um, about the costs that uh, accrued by uh, traveling, others will look at me, will, will form, others do, but there is a form. Uh, but there wasn't continuity. And so that's why this has been brought forward, is because as it stands in our contract with language, there is nothing. I mean, it's basically for building the building, that's it. And if you look at uh, our policies and regulations uh, from the board, one policy, uh, policy 2000, is called, and its title is Attendance to Conferences, Meetings, and Seminars, which really means more like in district business that I have with other employees or I'm going to a conference, but it doesn't really address um, traveling. Uh, this used to be the second thing. So um, we have that policy, we have that policy, um, policy 2000, and then regulation 2100-3, it does have a uh, request for reimbursement for industry travel, um, but that is, that is, that regulation is under the premise of, of policy 2000. So if, um, if you're a person that's not in the policy or even where that document is located on a district's website, uh, you do not know to look, look in those locations. So 
I got to this for Google's. Um, I know the administration has a mileage reimbursement. And they actually have stipends that, depending on what their level is in, in the contract. So the administration is given uh, reimbursement allowances from anywhere between $45 to $225. That's contractually up um, in a contract. So as I was researching this and thinking on it, uh, I'm hoping, I'm really hoping that we don't have to do too many uh, in-home visits uh, this year. But as last year, we had plenty of teachers that were traveling to, to many of these students. I thought it'd be best, I still think it'd be best that we just have, have one which in, uh, and I hope that we don't have to use it, if that makes sense. Does it make sense? No. Okay. Uh, I prefer that we're not traveling, but if we are, we are being compensated for our for the travel. Has anybody requested reimbursement for mileage that they spent with home business that they were denied? <laughs> Follow-up question would be: Has this been shared with uh, from administration? This is how uh, you can be reimbursed. It, 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 it's you're asking a question that I didn't deny. My response to that is: Do they even exist? I don't know. Do they? Yes. Yeah. I understand. I'm not one to add language just for the sake of adding language. I never have been. But that's what you're suggesting we do. So how do you rectify that situation of um, teacher knowing if we have to travel again? Communication. Sorry. Communication. Exactly. And so a contract is direct, clear, consistent protocol and communication. We know that there has been a great deal of fluctuation with administrators, staff, special educators did an inordinate amount of hoop jumping last year and um, were delivering assignments to students' homes and directly communicating not only through social mediums, emails, and phone calls, but also door to door, because sometimes that was all that worked this past year. And if we have new staff and new administration that don't know board policy, but are doing this as part of their duty did, having Travel reimbursement clearly spelled out it just makes it easier for everyone to know clear communication on what is available without abuse or misuse, but just there it is, board policy in the negotiated agreement. And you're correct, Emil, our communication is important. But when we were looking for this 2100-3, it, it was a bit of a scavenger hunt. We found it, a uh, team effort. And so uh, we often have members in our building who come to us and say, is there anything in the contract about this, fill in the blank? Uh, this would be one where 2100-3 means my children are in the room are working on something for while I dig that up, or I could just pull out the contract and say, yes, it's right here. Uh, so I, I hear what you're saying about adding language for the sake of adding language. Um, but we're, in this case, not asking for any more money. It's, it's not a monetary 
uh, increase or an increased expense. It's just uh, um, information access uh, is what we're asking for. That that it what what has already been agreed to uh, by the administration of Topeka Public Schools and directly affects the members who are covered by this contract. That the language just simply is restated in the contract. And we can even change the language where we refer in the contract teachers to 2100-3 and quote directly from that by putting it into this. I mean, we could we could be somewhat flexible on that. But uh, uh, it was, there, there were a number of home visits done uh, in an unusual sense last year. And we hope that uh, that diminishes this year. I am not personally aware of anybody who wasn't reimbursed, but we are all personally aware of people who did not know reimbursement was an option. Yeah, often some of the home visits that were made were, were made uh, at the request, in other words, not volunteered an administrator said I need you to go to this person's house uh, and, and, and find out what's going on knock on the door or whatever um, and you know we've done home visits for years we really have uh, this is yet another paper trail of home visits that are made when I was teaching special ed many years ago and had to make home visits I was accompanied by an SRO that's no longer an option uh, I can be accompanied by, when I made my home visit this year, by a social worker. Um, but uh, we're, we're wanting to make sure that our, our, our staff is safe, while at the same time trying to find the children that should be in school, or at least turning on their screens. Um, so we, we went above and beyond, and our administrators went above and beyond. Everybody went above and beyond. Uh, I know our division principals made multiple home visits. So um, just putting it out there where it's uh, accessible for for the members of the bargaining unit is what we're asking for. Was this uh, primarily driven by a uh, pandemic? What, 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 in 2019, um, the the length and breadth of it, yes, was driven by the pandemic. Visits by special education teachers has been ongoing forever. Um, and they get paid. Yeah, okay. they, they get, well, they get reimbursed, yes. Yeah, they do get reimbursed. But I'm saying that home visits for special education have always been, or, or visits. This has worked for them, right? Yes. They've gotten paid. So, so th this is really preempted and, and problematic again, like all of the things from COVID, response to COVID. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. COVID has That's That's exacerbated fair. everything. It's we, exacerbated. We Great. Great. Yeah. I do. <laughs> and that, that Everybody's was... writing down exacerbated, <laughs> right? I think I get credit for hearing that. Although I'm going to come across the table and have you check my spelling to make sure I did it. <laughs> Uh, but uh, that that concludes our our financial request for uh, this bargaining session. So, any follow up questions, concerns, uh, comments over any of the issues that we have brought? And I'm asking for our side as well. I do have a question about their eight hour eight okay. period day. As I'm sure your whole team is aware at this point, um, I'm in charge of our live stream. So I've had a multitude of high school staff members reaching out to me about the eight period day. Um, on both sides of that issue, some are um, more excited about the prospect of that than others. But one of the things that has come up several times is they are probably rightfully so um, concerned that if they are already teaching seven different courses and having to do seven preps, that adding an additional course to their day would add an additional, I'm sorry, not seven, because they have two off, five, would add an additional prep to their day. So they would potentially be prepping six different courses every single day, which causes some concern. So I am just asking you if you would consider the idea of potentially adding language that would 
stop that from going above five preps because we know that some of them already have those five preps. Can I get clarification of what you mean by prep? To me, prep is that you're teaching five completely yes. separate. Yes. Not, not that you're teaching three freshman English and two sophomore English. Correct. That would be two prep. Correct. So you're talking we have teachers that are doing five, five completely different classes. classes every day. So um, I would also clarify that we're, again, not talking about necessarily an eight period day but an eight period schedule. schedule. I'm sorry. So, so we wouldn't necessarily be talking about eight separate or six separate preps per day. Right. Um, so just to clarify that. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, potentially it could be four. Right. Uh, four different classes uh, in a day. Right. Um, but would you entertain the idea that adding an additional prep to staff members who already prep five courses whether that's over the course of a skinny day, as we call them, or a block day, um, is five is enough, and we would be willing to say that we are not going to add an additional prep to their schedule, and by adding an additional sixth, completely different class. Um, so yeah, I think that's something we could entertain in our discussion. Okay, thank you. Okay, Elar, how do you want to proceed? We obviously all need some time to talk with our teams. I've got 1041. Are we? I should say this in part of no, no. Okay, sorry. Thank you. I would like for us to focus on the uh, professional dress uh, item and come back to you on, on that too. Okay. Uh, as far as the uh, monetary items that were discussed this morning, uh, you would just break the rest of the day. And come back uh, tomorrow morning with uh, our counter proposal. Okay, do we want to take 20 or 30 minutes on dress, come back, discuss that, and then break for the day? Yes. Okay, I've got it. Sorry, I've got Lori asks, we'd like to do the same thing with the eight period schedule. Right. You know, recent resolution on that before we move on to strictly uh, the financial pieces. Okay. Do they want us to write the language about the cap or do they want to do that? <coughs> we'll, we'll come back. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll continue the discussion about insurance tomorrow then. Yes. So. I'm going to say right now we need to at least caucus till 11:30. I may need more time than that, but let's set that as a bookmark for right now. It may be 11:45 or that, uh, but, but we'll see what we get. What we get to. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. It's at 11:45. And Mr. Cope, I did get your language. Thank okay. you. On the sunset. <coughs> So then on your board note, what does that mean? We get lost. I don't know.